Dr. Sage here, back today to talk about invertebrates. So what are invertebrates? Well, as the name implies, any animal without vertebrae. This makes about 97% of all the animals living on this planet, and many invertebrates are aquatic. So to cover some terminology that goes along with the invertebrates, we have the parazoa, which means no true embryonic tissues. Sponges are in this category. They're asymmetrical, so they don't have any symmetry. Then we have the eumetazoa, or the metazoa. That means they have true embryonic tissues. This is all other animals. So every animal except for sponges are eumetazoa. There's symmetry, they can have radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry, which we learned about in a previous chapter. If they have radial symmetry, they can be diploblastic, which means they have two embryonic tissues, which is the endoderm and the ectoderm, so they don't have mesoderm. Example of these are cnidarians and tenophores. So these are the jellies, like jellyfish. Then you can have bilateral symmetry, in which case they're triploblastic, so they have three embryonic tissues. So the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. There are three main groups of the bilateral symmetry, platyhelminthes, and then the protosomes and the deuterosomes, which again, we briefly talked about protosomes and deuterosomes in the previous chapter. So now we're gonna start going through the different types of animals, starting with the sponges, which are in the phylum periphera. Sponges are the simplest of all animals. They're aquatic. They're parazoans, which means they have no true tissues. They're asymmetrical. And the adults are sessile, so they're not moving, but the larvae have motility. Now, sponges have no digestive, respiratory, circulatory, reproductive, or nervous systems. They're filter feeders and trap particles in the water with the aquanocytes as it flows through the osculum. So essentially, water is flowing through these sponges, okay? And as the water is flowing through the sponges, cells lining the interior of the sponge, shown in orange here, uh, as you can see magnified here, those are co called choanocytes. And those are what's trapping the food particles. Their reproduction can be asexual through budding or sexual, because sponges are hermaphroditic. They release egg and sperm into the water. So sponges are the parazoa, new true embryonic tissues. Now we're gonna talk about the eumetazoa, which means they have true embryonic tissues. First phylum is the cnidaria. So cnidarians are metazoans. They're diploblastic, so they have endoderm and ectoderm, but no mesoderm. They have radial symmetry, which remember means they don't have a left, right, front, back. Their symmetry is more like a flower pot where it's symmetrical all around the center. Cnidarians contain specialized cells called cnidocytes that contains nemocysts. Okay, so these are the, basically the stinging cells that you find in jellyfish. The cnidarians display two distinct body plans, a polyp, which is sessile, so it's not moving, and a medusa, okay, which can be free-floating. Now, some cnidarians display both body plans during their life cycle. Their reproduction can be asexual through budding, as we see in corals, for example, or sexual, which is when they release the gametes into the water. They have a very primitive nervous system called the nerve net, they have a gastrovascular cavity, which means they have one opening. So that serves both the mouth and the anus. The digestion takes place here. That's why also we exchange gases. They're carnivorous. And we're gonna briefly talk about four classes of the cnidaria, starting with the anthrozoa. These are corals or sea anemones, and they have a polyp body plan. The next class is a scyphozoa. In this class, the medusa is a prominent body stage, and these are what you typically think of as jellyfish, technically called jellies, because they're not actually fish. Next class is the cubozoa. These are box-shaped medusa, or box jellies. These are the most dangerous of all cnidarians. Can cause serious harm or death to humans, for example. Then you have the class hydrozoa. They have both the polyp and the medusa forms. And it includes hydra and the Portuguese man of war, which is one of the various poisonous jellies that you can get stung by. The next phylum is the tentophora. These are comb jellies. They're also diploblastic and have radial symmetry. They do not have the cnidocytes like the cnidarians, so they don't have those stinging cells. They also have a complete gut. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the animals with bilateral symmetry instead of radial symmetry. These are triploblastic, so they have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. There are three groups, the platyhelminthes, which are acoleomates, 
The proteasomes, which are coleomates, and they're made up of the lophotrazoans and the ectozyzoans. Then you have the deuterosomes, which are coleomates. Those are echinoderms and chordates. And again, we're gonna go through each of these different categories, starting with the flatworms. So they have a gastrovascular cavity. They do not have a complete gut. They're hermaphroditic. Some are free living and some are parasitic. And you start to see development of cephalization in these animals. So a head region starts to form where the sensory organs are congregated. So here's some examples of these flatworms, the planaria, the flukes, and the tapeworms. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the proteasomes. Recall we learned about the differences between proteasomes and deuterosomes in the previous chapter. The first superphylum of the proteasomes are the lophotrozoa. A lot of lophotrozoans have a lophophore, which is used to filter feed and is used in gas exchange. And a lot of them have a larval form called a trophophore larva. First phylum within the lophotrozoa superphylum is the rotifera. These are microscopic animals, part of the zooplankton. Then we have the phylum Nemeratia, which are the ribbon worms. Next, we have the phylum Mollusca. These are predominantly marine living organisms. Their body plan is they have a mantle, which excretes a shell, a muscular foot, and a visceral mass, which is where the organs are located. They do have a complete digestive system, and they have gills for respiration. They have an open circulatory system, except for the cephalopods that have a closed circulatory system. And within this phylum, we have these four classes that we're going to talk about. First class is Polyplectophora. They have many plates, and they have radula to scrape algae off rocks. Next class is the gastropoda. The gastropods are things like snails and slugs. Slugs don't have a shell. Conchs and nulli branches. Then you have class bivalva, which are clams, oysters, and scallops. And then the class cephalopoda, which technically means head foot. These are things like octopus, squid, and nautilus. Uh, this is the most unique group of mollusks. They do have a closed circulatory system, like we have a closed circulatory system, and they're an intelligent group of invertebrates. Next phylum that we're going to discuss is the Annelidia. The Annelidia are the segmented worms. They have repeated body segments. These are the most advanced worms. They have a complete digestive system and a closed circulatory system. These are things you've heard of before, like earthworms, leeches, and marine worms. The next superphylum is the Ectizoa. This is a huge group of animals. It includes the arthropods and the nematodes. They have an external covering called a cuticle that molts, and that process is called ectysis. First phylum in the superphylum ectizoa is the phylum nematoda. Okay, these are pseudocoleomates. Many are parasitic, and C. elegans, Cineraptitis elegans, is a type of nematoda that is often used in scientific research. Next phylum is the Anthropodia. This phylum technically means jointed legs. This group dominates the animal kingdom. The exoskeleton is made of chitin. They have an open circulatory system. They have hemocyl, which is cavity-containing organs. Their respiration can be gills found in crustaceans or trachea tubes found in insects. Then we have the uh, subphylum, Hexapoda. This Hex, is prefix means six, so these have six legs, and they includes the insects. Their respiration is through openings, spiracles, and the exoskeleton that leads to tubes, trachea, that branch through the body. Next phylum is a miropoda, two types, chylopods and dilopods. The chylopods are the centipedes. They have one set of legs per segment, and they're carnivores. The dilopoda are the millipedes. They have two sets of legs per segment and they're herbivores. Next subphylum is the crustacea. These are mostly aquatic. Their respiration is through gills and their covering is referred to as a carapace. Examples of this subphylum crustacea is a giant isopod or an, and the largest land crab. The larval form of this group is mainly the nautilus larva. The next subphylum is the chila serrata. These are spiders and horseshoe crabs. They have claw-like or fang-like mouth parts. Now, up until this point, we've been talking about proteasome animals. Now, we're gonna start talking about deuterosome animals. 
The deuterosomes are the econoderms and the chordates. Now in this chapter, the only chordates that we're gonna talk about are the invertebrates. The next chapter, we'll talk about the chordates that are vertebrates. So the phylum Echinodermata, Echino means spiny, derma means skin. The adult Echinoderms exhibit parental radial symmetry. Their larval forms have bilateral symmetry. They're capable of regeneration. They have a water vascular system. Up until this point, we've seen further development of cephalization in the animals, but the Echinoderms lack a head region, but they do have a nerve ring. So these are examples in the phyla of Echinodermata. We have sea stars, brittle stars, sea urchins and sand dollars, sea lilies, and sea cucumbers. As you can see, they lack a true head, so they don't have that full cephalization. Then we have the phylum chordata. All chordates possess the following characteristics at some point during their life cycle. It might only be during uh, embryonic development, but at some point they have these traits. They have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, they have a notochord, they have a post-anal tail, and they have pharyngeal slits. Now, within the phylum chordata, we have the subphylum euochordata, which are invertebrates, cephalochordata, which are invertebrates. We're going to talk about those today, these two. And then the subphylum vibrata, which have vertebrae. We're not going to talk about them until the next chapter. So the subphylum euochordata are the tunicates, and their larva resembles a tadpole. While the subphylum cephalochordata are the lancelets, they're small filter feeders they bury in substrate. Okay, so that was a very quick run through of uh, the definition of invertebrates and the different types of invertebrates. In the next lecture, we're gonna learn about the vertebrates. Until then, this has been Dr. Sage.